The matrix of a transformation is completely determined by the transformed versions of the basis vectors. If we're using standard basis, this is easy. Let's say that this transformation is going from R2 to R2 using the standard basis of E1 and E2, 1, 0, and 0, 1. Let's do a 90 degree rotation counterclockwise. E1 would become 0, 1, and E2 would become negative 1, 0. So this is the matrix of the transformation. If we wanted to see what happens to any coordinate x, y, we multiply by x, y. We get negative y, x. If we're finding the matrix of a transformation that's not in R, n, for example, if we're in P2, which is polynomials with a degree at most 2, we have to use coordinate isomorphism. We use coordinate isomorphism to convert from a different basis into the standard basis of Rn. Let's take a look at a general example. If a vector space V has a basis B1 to Bn, let's take a general vector in this vector space. We could say it's a linear combination of the basis vectors, right? And coordinate isomorphism means that we take the coefficients of these basis vectors and they become the coordinates of the standard basis in Rn. So E1 and E2 all the way till En. E1 would be 1 and then zeros. E2 would be 0, 1, and then zeros. So adding all these terms together, we'll get V1 till Vn. If we want to write it in vector notation, V1, V2, all the way till Vn, where the coefficients become coordinates of a vector in Rn. We could think of this as a transformation in and of itself. This coordinate isomorphism takes a vector in V and rewrites it as a vector in Rn. What would this look like in our case if we take the coordinate isomorphism of a general vector in P2, which would be a linear combination of the basis vectors, let's say a plus bx plus cx squared. This could be rewritten as a, B, C. Having this standard basis makes it a lot easier, but let's keep going to see what happens. A becomes A plus C, B becomes B minus C, and C becomes 2A plus B plus C. We could now write this as the transformed version of A, B, C would become, and now we can identify the matrix of our transformation. In our first column, we'll have all the terms with an A, 1, 0, 2, in our next column, it's the B column, 0, 1, 1. And the third is the C column. We'll see that if we multiply by A, B, C, we get the exact same thing. So this is the matrix of our transformation. Next, let's find the coordinates of vector V in terms of the basis B, which is a non-standard basis of M22, 2 by 2, two, two matrices. Since V is a 2 by 2 matrix, we can express it as a linear combination of these basis vectors. Now we can simplify the left side by doing this addition. And our goal is to find these coordinates, find A, B, C, and D. Well, we end up with four equations. We already know that C is four. We can plug it into our first equation. Then let's isolate for A. We could solve this using a matrix, but let's just use substitution. We can plug in our value for A into the second equation. Then we can isolate for D, plug that into our third equation. Now we can finally find what B is, move the 5 to the opposite side, then divide by 2. Now we can plug in B to find A and D. This means that our matrix V can be written as negative 2 times our first basis vector, minus 1 times the second, plus 4 times the third, plus 4 times the last matrix. The coordinates of the vector v in terms of the basis b are going to be negative 2, negative 1, 4, 4. The coefficients become the coordinates of the vector in R4. Let's take a look at this commutative diagram. Let's start here at the top. v and w are two vector spaces and t represents a linear transformation. If we were to first apply the transformation, next if we use coordinate isomorphism, like we just talked about, where W has a basis of D and V has a basis of B, we'll get a vector in Rm. This is almost like translating a vector in W into Rm. 
If we were to go the opposite direction, we were to first translate into Rn using coordinate isomorphism, then apply the matrix of the transformation, we end up in the same spot. This mdb of t means that we're going from basis b to d. Since coordinate isomorphisms are always invertible, we can go in both directions. This allows us to isolate for t or for the matrix of the transformation. t would be the same as going the long way around. If we first translated into Rn, then applied the matrix of the transformation, then translated our vector in Rm back into W, we're going the opposite direction, so this would be CD inverse, we end up in the same spot. We could also isolate this matrix. This would be the same as first translating into our vector space V. We're going in the opposite direction of the arrow. This would be the inverse, then applying the transformation, and then converting back to Rm. The columns of this matrix could be written as the coordinate isomorphism of each of the transformed basis vectors of basis B. This is because the inverse of the coordinate isomorphism means we get back to the basis B, we get back to these basis vectors, then we apply the transformation, and then we use the coordinate isomorphism. Let's try an example to make sense of all this. Let's find the action of T, the transformation from P2 to R2, if we're given the matrix of the transformation in terms of basis B and D. T would be the same as first applying the coordinate isomorphism to convert to R3, then applying the matrix of the transformation, and then apply the inverse of the coordinate isomorphism to convert from a vector with the standard basis of R2 back into basis D. Firstly, let's find CB. This is very easy. B is already a standard basis, so we can rewrite a general polynomial. A plus BX plus CX squared will just be A, B, C. The coefficients become the coordinates of a vector in R3. Next, what's a general vector in R2? We could say x, y, and then express this as a linear combination of the two basis vectors in the basis D. We can immediately see a is x, y equals a plus b, which means that b is y minus x. So now a vector x, y, in terms of the basis D, would be written as x, y minus x. Now let's just compute the transformation of, let's say, a specific vector in P2. What would the coordinate isomorphism of that same polynomial be? Well, we can see the rule up here. It's just going to be A, B, C. Now we can do this multiplication. And now we need the inverse of C, D. To find this, we can just do it by inspections since it's not too complicated. But in the next example, I'll show you how to do it a more systematic way. We see that the first component becomes the first component. The opposite of this would be the exact same thing. Next, for the second component, we see we have the second component minus the first component. The opposite of that would be the second component plus the first component. And of course, if you wanted to check your work, try CD, CD inverse, or the opposite, CD inverse, then CD, and make sure you get back what you put in, meaning that this operation does nothing. Next, let's apply this rule that we just generated. Our second component will add these two terms together. And we have now defined our transformation. A polynomial becomes the coordinate 2a plus b plus 3c, comma, a plus b plus c. Let's find the matrix of this transformation with respect to bases b and d. These are non-standard bases, so we'll have to use coordinate isomorphism to change the basis so we can find this matrix. First, if we were to apply the inverse of CB, then T, then D, we'll find our matrix. Secondly, we could transform the basis vectors of vector space V, then apply the coordinate isomorphism, and this will also form our matrix. Let's start by finding what a vector in P2 and R3 look like when we convert to the standard basis of R3. D is a bit easier, so let's start with that one. Let's pick a vector in R3, say A, B, C. This can be expressed as a linear combination of the basis vectors in basis D. Next, we can write our three equations, 
and our goal is to find E, F, and H, the coefficients, in terms of A, B, and C. We can already see that H is B. Let's isolate E in our third equation. We can then plug this into our first equation, and now we can solve for F. We can plug this into our third equation to find E. This will be C plus A over 2. Now we found our coefficients, so we can write the coordinate isomorphism. A general vector in R3 with these basis vectors would be written like so. Next, we can find the matrix of our transformation. This is one solution, as there are different ways of finding the same answer. Let's say this is B1, B2, and B3. The columns of our matrix are found by first transforming our basis vectors. This means going from P2 to R3, and then applying the coordinate isomorphism, which means expressing a vector in R3 with a basis D in terms of the standard basis of R3. Next, let's apply our transformation, and then the coordinate isomorphism to generate the columns of our matrix. From our commutative diagram, we found that this is another way to find the matrix of the transformation. To use this, we need the inverse of the coordinate isomorphism of basis B. This is good practice. B is a basis for P2. Let's write a general polynomial. We can express it as a linear combination of B1, B2, and B3. We end up with three equations, and this time let's solve using a matrix. To begin, let's interchange row 3 and row 1, as I see a 0 and I want to take advantage of that. Next, we can do row 2 minus row 1 and row 3 minus row 1. Now, row 3 plus row 2, and we can do negative 1 times row 2. Lastly, to generate a leading one, let's do row 3 divided by negative 3. To simplify, we can do row 1 minus row 3 and row 2 minus row 3. We can rewrite C as 3C over 3 and subtract the third row, so plus A plus B minus 2C, which leaves us with A plus B plus C over 3. For our second term, we can again rewrite that with a base of 3, negative 3B plus 3C over 3 minus the third row, leaving us with A minus 2B plus C over 3. We've now found the coefficients, which we were looking for, which become the coordinates of a vector in R3. Instead of expressing a plus bx plus cx squared, in terms of this basis, we would write it differently. e times the first basis vector plus f times the second plus h times the third. And we've now found what these values actually are. Now we didn't actually need cb, we needed cb inverse. If we take the inverse of both sides, we'll be left with CB inverse times some vector, let's say STU, equals just our standard polynomial. To find what ST and U are, we can equate our terms. Let's begin by isolating for A. Then we can plug this into our second equation. We got T is S minus B. We're looking for A, B, and C. In terms of S to U, we can now say that B is S minus T. Plug in B into our first equation for A again. We'll end up with 2S plus T minus C. We can now use these A and B in our third equation. Negative 2S minus S will get negative 3S minus T plus T. We don't have any T's. Plus C plus 2C. So u is negative s plus c, which means we can find c, and now use that to find a. And we've now found the inverse of the coordinate isomorphism. If we wanted to use a, b, and c just to be consistent, we could easily switch these letters at this point. And now we can compute the matrix. First, let's apply this inverse coordinate isomorphism to go from R3 back into P2. Then we can apply our transformation the first coefficient minus the third coefficient, a minus a, b minus c minus c. Next, we'll have 2 times our second coefficient, 2a minus 2b. Lastly, our first coefficient plus our last coefficient, 2a plus b and no c. And now our goal is to apply the coordinate isomorphism in order to express this coordinate using the standard basis of R3. We do first plus last divided by 2. 2a plus 
2b minus 2c divided by 2, then first minus last divided by 2, and our third component is just our middle term. To find the matrix, all we have to do is remove the a, b, and c, rewrite it as matrix vector multiplication, and we arrive at the same matrix.